The events in Ukraine have been dominating the news, and Manchester is doing its bit to help during the crisis. Last week, Manchester Baroque and Manchester Cathedral launched a fundraising appeal for the people of Ukraine. This will culminate in a charity concert on Good Friday with a performance of the St John Passion. All of the proceeds from tickets will be donated to UK Med, which last week launched an emergency appeal backed by Andy Burnham and GMCA. We spoke to Mike Emrick, the chair of Manchester Borough Board, and Bev Craig, leader of Manchester Council. Hi, I'm Mike Emrick. I'm the chair of the board of Manchester Baroque. Um, and uh, we've planned this concert, this John Passion, uh, on Good Friday with Manchester Cathedral Choir for months. But it was about, I think it was the, not the weekend, gone the weekend before, I was sat with uh, my other half and we felt so impotent about what was going on in Ukraine. I asked a question which I've spent the last 10 days answering, which is what would happen if we were to raise enough money for the St John Passion that we could pay for the musicians ourselves out of that funding and then make it a fundraiser for Ukraine? Anyway, we did. We've raised several thousand pounds in the last week to pay for the musicians, so everyone's going to get paid, which means that every single penny we raise on the day goes to um, UK Med, the, the Mayor's nominated charity for Ukraine. And... I'll sleep a little bit better in my bed knowing that I'm doing something vaguely useful in this most bloody awful of situations. Um, okay, can you explain what's going on here today and the part that Manchester Council is playing in it? Um, so I'm here today to support the launch of a fundraising concert for UK Meds. It's been organised by Manchester Cathedral and Orchestra coming together to raise all proceeds that go directly to UK Mads. One of the things that Manchester people ask me is what can they do to help? You know, we're all devastated by what we see on our TV screens. And there is a direct need to get money to the people that need us most on the ground. And initiatives like this, it's one of many across the city, um, but quite a special one in the cathedral on Good Friday, is a real opportunity to be able to, to donate to the organisations that can actually make a difference on the ground. Okay, what other things are happening around Greater Manchester? Um, there's lots of things going on here in Manchester. We're home to um, a large and, and vibrant Ukrainian community, many of whom have lived here for generations and some that have come more recently in mid-Manchester, their home. Um, so we're being led um, on the ground by a lot of what local people tell us that they need and what their families and loved ones back home need as well. We've been showing our support in a range of ways, you know, from, from day one, lighting up the town hall, um, library, in the colours of the Ukrainian flag to showing our solidarity to our local community groups. There's lots of different things going on, lots of different appeals happening. And when the government provides clarity on the visa process here in Manchester, we'll be welcoming refugees from the Ukraine to come and join their families to either to temporary respite in a city like Manchester or to make it its home and we'll do our bit in making sure they feel supported. What, what have you heard from the people in the Ukrainian community? You, you must have been communicating with them quite a lot. What, what are their feelings about what's going on? I mean, you, you can imagine really, and we're joined here today by a number of students and, and cultural organisations from Ukraine um, in the cathedral and, you know, we would all share the, the heartbreak and, you know, sense of panic that they're experiencing when they've got loved ones and friends and family and um, back home. But also those that have been settled here for some time, you know, they're telling us around the impact that it has, you know, on their, their very well-being. It's very distressing um, and we're keen to support them in whatever way we can. Okay. I'm putting your political hat on there. How, how do you feel that this crisis should, should finish? I mean, it, it's really clear that Putin has made an unprovoked attack of war. And I think there's a really, really clear case to be made for further sanctions, as I've been doing across Europe and across the UK and the US. And that will need to go further and it will need to go faster um, if there's any opportunity to de-escalate the war. A group of students at the University of Manchester have set up a society for the people of Ukraine. We spoke to two of them. Uh, my name is Mary. I'm the president of a new uh, Ukrainian society at the University of Manchester. Okay. Uh, and I'm Sasha. I'm one of the members of the Ukrainian society at the University of Manchester. Okay. So you just set up this society then yeah. in response to the crisis? Exactly. Um, we literally uh, got the idea about a week ago. So the society was uh, launched officially four or five days ago, uh, but it was really crucial to do it 
as soon as possible. And actually, the university made an exception for us because usually the societies are set up at the start of the year. Uh, so yeah, they, we literally made it in like two hours and trying to uh, go for it with new projects, maybe stalls or fundraiser uh, along with the university. Okay. And what's what's behind the, 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 the society? What are you hoping to it will achieve? Well, we're hoping to raise awareness to about what's going on in Ukraine and um, also help in any way, way we can through donations, uh, finding a suitable charity that we can support and um, yeah, just help the Ukrainian people out okay. as much as we can. Okay. Sure, because technically uh, each person who is Ukrainian is now feeling abroad especially that like you really want to help but you don't know how to do it on your own but like when we gather together we can actually make a bit of a difference okay. that will maybe save someone's I don't know, like maybe we have been uh, along with the Polish society we have been raising uh uh, stuff uh, as a uh, stall uh, last two day for the last two days for the refugees in Poland. Okay. Uh, so that is like one of the first steps we did to help mm. people. Okay. Do you still have uh, relatives in Ukraine? Um, yes, I have my okay. grandparents still in Ukraine. Okay. Uh, have yeah. you been able to get in touch with them? I've been able to get in touch with them. Okay. Yes. It's, uh, it's and how are they doing? Where, whereabouts are they? Um, they are. Well, my grandparents are about two hours drive um, west of Kiev, uh, Kiev. Okay. And um, they're as safe as can be in these okay. times. And, okay. Yeah, refusing to leave, which has been uh, very, uh, very tough on okay. both myself and my parents. Okay. And yourself? Um, yeah. Well, I guess, unlike Sasha, I left Ukraine literally like a year or two ago. Uh, so most of my friends and family are all in Ukraine in different parts of it, but mostly it's like Kiev because like I'm originally from the city, uh, literally city center. They left the city kind of around the um, in the summer house for now. But like, well, I am trying to convince them to at least move to the western part of Ukraine for now. Okay. Uh, yeah, grandparents also refusing. Most people I know, as well, like even my friends of my age, which is a bit weird, uh, say that like no, we'll stay as long as possible because it's our land. And we want to be here, we want to defend it, um, yeah, do it as much as possible. Okay. I'm not going to get too political, but how do you see this crisis ending? Well, we're both engineers, so not really into, <laughs> yeah. like, a political we're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not into political predictions, that's true. But, no, no. I mean, we, we hope for a favourable outcome for Ukraine and... Um, we pray for that and yeah that's sure what i can say is that um as i can say it ukraine is doing 100 percent, maybe even 200 percent of what they can so any hmm. outcome that we can expect will be a result not only of ukrainian actions but the actions that might maybe other governments can take yeah. european support because everything is now on the scales and uh, any action we can take will also contribute Next, we speak to a member of the team at the Ukrainian Cultural Centre in Cheatham Hill. We talk about how the current conflict is affecting her and touch on her relation to the Ukraine. Leslie, can you just introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Gina Manzi uh, and I'm from the Ukrainian Cultural Centre at uh, Cheatham Hill. And what's your role there? Uh, my present hat is uh, the chair of the Association of Ukrainian Women in Great Britain, Manchester branch. But I've worked at the centre for nearly 40 years, so I've worn many hats. OK. Are you originally from Ukraine? or No, I was born in Rochdale. OK. But were Ukrainian parents? Or... My Ukrainian parents came as refugees after the war. OK. Um, have you still got relatives out there? Yes, yes. Have a you... lot in western Ukraine, but we've got friends in Kyiv okay. and, and friends in the east as well. So. OK. Have you managed to get in touch with them? The Kyiv ones we haven't, actually. Um, um, I think they may have left the city somewhere that's a little bit away from the main city so we, we haven't been able to track them down but we have finally been able to contact family in the Lviv and ivano Frankivsk area. Uh, we also have people in Kharkiv and Dnipro and we haven't been able there that's much further east and we haven't been able to contact them mm. um, but um, yeah uh, they're, they're mostly all right but uh, my cousin's son, so what is he, my second cousin, um, he volunteered when 
um, the problem when the war started in the east in 2014. So he's been with the Azov Brigade uh, as a volunteer, right. and uh, he's nearly 30 now. And for last Thursday, um, he was wounded. He was shot in the stomach, oh, and okay. uh, it was quite serious. He had to have immediate operation. So they took him, I think, Kharkiv to a big city. And uh, a couple of days later, they're moving him to Lviv now. There's a big rehabilitation hospital uh, that actually does the whole army. They're very specialised. Right. It's like if they need, um, you know, if they're amputees and they need prosthetics or, or even if they need, you know, sort of counselling, if they've been, you know, sort of mentally disturbed and things like that, which right. a lot are. Uh, and that it's a very specialist and good hospital. And so his mum was saying to me, uh, I'm so glad because it's only like an hour and a half away, so we'll be able to see our son. Um, oh, we nice. haven't heard for a couple of days, but no news is good news. Okay. Well, okay. He must be okay. A silly question, really. You're also working with the Ukrainian community. What, what sort of feelings are you getting from them about this crisis? Well, you know, everybody's... Well, it was shock, um, you know, sort of very emotional... Um, and then anger. Um, unbelievable that he could do something like this for absolutely no reason. Um, and, you know, all the fairy tales that he makes up about his reasons, all the fake news, all the twists and turns. I mean, even when he's speaking to, you know, the president of America or NATO or you name it, he will twist whatever they've said to suit himself and said, if you dare do that, you will face the consequences. And he's a total madman and everybody's just sitting watching him and, and you know, Ukraine, Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian people are dying. Um they have asked for um, uh, help to actually, you know, sort of uh, cover the skies. You can screen the skies, uh, mm -hmm. and there's. But uh, Putin uh, says that I will take that as an act of war. I talked to my son yesterday. He said nowhere would anybody interpret that as an act of war except Putin. It's a protection. But still, they're saying, well, we just don't know how he'll react. So they're not getting help with air cover. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the soldiers on the ground are doing very well. But there's people trying to stop tanks and armor cars in the street they yeah, come yeah. out with absolutely no you know sort of arm and no no guns or anything mm -hmm. they just block the street and shout go home okay. <laughs> leave us alone go home and they have to stop i mean then they get out and shoot guns into the sky to scare them mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. pick their way through but um you know putin thinks that you know he's got a much bigger army but he didn't he didn't actually count on all the volunteers that mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. you know sort of they're trying to save the homes, they're trying to save the country. Mm -hmm. Do you think the West should be doing more? Well, it's like I say, it's hard to watch, uh, you know, sort of NATO are giving them certain, um, you know, sort of, I think, anti-tank missiles and things like that. But this air cover is fairly crucial. But they've brought in uh, planes and they said about 7,000 troops to the Baltic. Uh, and uh, so I said, well, what are you going to do? You're going to sit on the edge and watch as they kill them all. You know, it's like... They're taking a long time sometimes between decisions. I understand that the consequences, they keep saying, oh, we'll have third world war. I think it started and they just haven't got it. They haven't got it yet. Yeah. Uh, and that, and uh, the UN, the, the UN Security Council has a rotating <coughs> head. And at the moment, it's a Russian. And the UN are allowing a Russian to run the Security Council for the UN and uh, they work on a system where when they vote on anything they only need one person to veto and the thing falls through it's not a majority vote mm -hmm. so you know you might have three people two abstain russia says no nothing happens so i don't understand how the un it's very democratic of them to let mm -hmm. a russian at this time sit at the head of the table oh come on wake up okay. you know? we spoke to the chief executive of charity europia we asked what they have been doing to help Ukrainians during the crisis. Hi, my name is Kush Chotera. I'm the chief executive of a charity called Europia, and we support EU nationals across GM. Okay. And what sort of work are you doing in regards to the crisis in Ukraine? So something that we did immediately is set up a fundraiser, and we have raised already some and a half thousand pounds. And it's not just any fundraiser. What we have done is we've spoken to the community and we've asked them what should the money go to. So the community have decided the money should go to Ukraine and the neighboring countries taking the refugees. Okay. So 100% of the money will be sent to civil organizations in this country so they can support the communities there. Okay. So that's the first thing we have done. The second thing we are doing is 
we are hosting lots of listening sessions listening to what is happening within the community talking to people and seeing how can we support them so some of the things that's coming through is they want immigration advice and they want they want mental health advice and more practical things which will help them achieve some sort of support over here at these difficult times so the work that we are doing is more forward planning and forward thinking okay. because it's literally been 10 days since the war started and the war is still going on so what is going to happen after this was stop so what are the services practical services that's required so we are thinking about the future and planning for the future and we're also speaking to the 10 local authorities to see how they can invest in the plan that we are putting together to supporting the community our final piece this week is with ben williams lecturer in politics and political theory at the university of salford who spoke to us about the current situation and how it could be resolved. Is this a precursor to a, a more general European war or will it stay as an isolated conflict? I mean, no one really knows the answer to that. I mean, um, deterrence theory would suggest we're not going to have a full-blown war because no one's going to push the other side that far. They all know each other's capabilities. So mm-hmm. uh, Russia arguably would not go beyond Ukraine because if it did... that would provoke the west into responding uh because of nato fifth article um if america and the west though intervene in ukraine by imposing a no fly zone that will provoke russia because of course russia has said that's its domain its sphere mm-hmm. and they would see any sort of intervention like that as an act of war so on the basis that both side knows each other's like red lines as it were then we could probably say no but mm-hmm. the problem is they are both provoking each other and it's where the prov- the provocation does at some point either intentionally or accidentally mm-hmm. overstep the mark and there is there is some talk i heard in the media about you know sometimes accidents happen stray missiles mm-hmm. things that aren't meant to happen happen that trigger a chain of events okay. that follow and then the latest one i hear this morning is the fear of of, of chemical or yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. biological weapons being used now Russia are apparently indicating uh they 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 argue that, that they have found evidence that Ukraine has biological weapons now there is no evidence actually being produced as yet and people are saying this is something they did in Syria uh was a precursor to then using biological weapons and that really could well be a red line that mm-hmm. the west can't stop and mm-hmm. not do anything about they may have to intervene at that point mm-hmm. which of course in answer to your question would then possibly trigger a full on bigger war but i mean there are some people who argue this is the start we have already began the world war as it were and this is just the initial skirmishes and and it's inevitably going to escalate right, okay is the more the west could be doing to intervene and protect the certainly the civilian population well the minute does they... that cross the red lines that you talked about The no fly zone is the red line is at the moment and of course that's what the Ukrainian government wants but most people accept that that would be very provocative and would almost certainly lead to a a much bigger conflict with Russia fighting American and NATO forces which would then would be World War 3 at the moment the argument is sanctions and sanctions have apparently been done on a kind of unprecedented scale um that never before have this volume of sanctions been imposed but The problem it would appear potentially is that Russia is a fairly well-resourced nation and it has all their means of resources coming in from other sources who aren't mes- necessarily cooperating like you know for example China and India by all accounts are not sanctioning them to the same degree. Mm-hmm. So if Russia has calculated it can cope with sanctions and still rely on its own exports and imports from other countries then the problem then is the sanctions aren't really working. um and if if sanctions do work they're going to be maybe long term and unfortunately at the moment because people are being killed every day long term solutions don't seem to be solving the problem on the ground whereby mm-hmm. people are dying on a daily basis and people want short term quicker answers and being told well six months down the line the russian economy will collapse that's not very good to people who are mm-hmm. who are being bombed every day mm-hmm. so The West is in a difficult position definitely. Um it does appear to be fairly united which is a, which is supposed to be a positive thing yeah. from the West perspective. Um could America 
have done more in the past, possibly so. Um, it, it's highly possible that this is a consequence of American kind of relative decline and the Russians would not have tried this 10 years ago, but they've, mm-hmm. they've observed a kind of decline in America, mm-hmm. uh, its power, its status, possibly behaviour of Donald Trump have prompted the Russians to think we can get away with this because America would not... Is not the what there's not this hegemon it once was. Mm-hmm. Do you think they've been surprised by the re- reaction in the West? Uh, well, by all accounts, Putin was planning on it. There being division in the West and not reacting in this way, um, and the West has has reacted in a kind of very unified way. I mean, you know, there is an argument to say how the West has reacted. Putin has said he sees it as an act of war. He sees the West's response by providing the Ukrainians with all the support Mm -hmm. is hostile to Russia. Mm -hmm. I I mean, as of yet, he he said that, but hasn't done anything about it. Um, But the West is, does appear to be fairly united in its outrage. But again, it appears fairly impotent in actually what it can do. I mean, the EU and the UN are the key institutions. And they, of course, have condemned it and put various mechanisms in place to try and restrict Russia. But again, we're, what, we're two, two weeks in, and yet, as of yet, mm-hmm. nothing appears to have happened. I mean, mm-hmm. it's possible they, they have to be vigilant, not necessarily for, for military response from, from Russia, but of course there's been allegations of cyber attacks and other kinds of... You know, Russia, of course, have poisoned people in this country in the yeah, past. There's, there's, have, yeah. there's, there's the issues like that where... The West will have to be vigilant that not necessarily Russia responds militarily, but can respond in more underhand, devious methods that could destabilise the West. Mm-hmm. Okay, are we are we going to go back to a Cold War scenario where where the West has to is going to be forced to spend more on its military? I mean, we we have this question in our like seminars and in questions we pose in, 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 in the university and um, you know that of course is, is a debatable point um, there is an argument to say this you know, the Cold War isn't just happening now the Cold War has actually been rumbling on okay. it maybe it came so, to an end so it didn't stop maybe. well there's a, there is an argument to say it never really stopped okay maybe <laughs> maybe in the 1990s there was like a lull where the Russians yeah. were that weak they couldn't really resist and the allegations are now that we've got a, a new Cold War possibly Involving China and Russia with America, mm-hmm. and it's kind of like a like a tripolar Cold War with the three superpowers competing with each other. Now, conventional wisdom until recently would say that the two big powers were America and China, and all the evidence suggests that in terms of military and economics, they are the two big powers. But Putin seems to be quite resentful of that, and maybe this is like his way of imposing Russia into the mix because mm-hmm. he's previously said. He believes that there should be a multipolar world with several big powers balancing each other out. Okay. And that would involve a role for Russia. So it's possible that we're in a Cold War. We never really left it, but we're in like a reformulated Cold War. And we've either got a revived Russia versus the USA or a revived Russia, USA and China all together interacting. Mm-hmm. And of course, China's critical in this. China is stories today that China are maybe potentially going to be able to put pressure on Russia to bring them into line but mm. of course that remains to be seen okay and i suppose the final question for the people that we've spoken to earlier this week that have, that have got relatives out there and uh, are supplying humanitarian aid to, to poland and other countries around what hope could can we give those people that their relatives in ukraine are going to come out of this safely if we can i mean i, I think it would be like a very naive politician to give them an absolute categoric clean bill of health and say everything's going to be wonderful because of course you've got to be realistic and at the moment it doesn't look it doesn't look good Mm -hmm. i mean all the west can say is they will continue to put diplomatic pressure on russia uh they'll continue to impose the sanctions and they'll continue to support humanitarian aid and accommodation for refugees and 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 make sure you know prior prioritise uh, civilian evacuations from areas that are besieged. That really is the only major reassurance the West can give. The West cannot just wave a magic wand and stop the war. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The West have got to try and mitigate what's going on and bring things kind of under some control and ensure as many innocent people as possible 
are retrieved from the situation. Obviously, it's different for soldiers. Soldiers are there in conflict. That's what, in a way, they're there to do. And there will be casualties among soldiers. But in a war, civilians are supposed to not be affected in this way. And yeah, and again, we, we are seeing again, aren't we, evidence that mm-hmm. uh, apparently Putin could have been committing war crimes mm-hmm. by bombing civilian areas. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's something, again, that needs to be looked at. But yeah, to people who've got families there, the West have just got to just say to them, we're doing it all, all we can to safeguard your families to either get them out or to make sure where they are can be safe as possibly can in this extreme mm-hmm. situation. And from Russia's point of view, they, they, they would see it finishing with taking over the country and putting a, a puppet regime in place? That would appear to have been the plan. And, I mean, there is some speculation as do they want the whole country or do they just want a, a chunk of the country? I mean, the evidence today looks like they're, they're ploughing further into the country, into other parts. Um, yet to have a puppet regime. The problem would appear to be, though, and I don't know whether this was a miscalculation of Russia, it would appear that they thought they'd have some degree of kind of grassroots support on the ground from a lot of the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are some Ukrainians with sympathies to Russia, but I think they thought there'd be more of that, that people thought they would be coming to to liberate them as they see it. But Mm -hmm. what appears to be happening is the Ukrainians, which, you know, Ukraine is a relatively new country. It's only had its own sovereignty, independence for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. They obviously feel very strongly about that and, and many of them appear willing to die and fight protecting that sovereignty so I don't know whether him having control and having a puppet regime in place is going to work because that resistance is never going to go away mm-hmm. not unless we are talking mass killings and flattening entire towns and cities which again would be an escalation that maybe the West couldn't tolerate but as in Syria as in Syria, perhaps, but then, yeah, but then I don't know whether there was the same degree of broad opposition in Syria than there is in Ukraine. He, in, in Syria, you could argue he was propping up an existing regime that asked for his help. Mm-hmm. Here, he's removing a regime that doesn't want his help, and it would appear most of the citizens don't want his help. So it, it's not unthinkable that he might take Kiev and he might have control of it, but whether he would have the control of the country in the longer term seems doubtful and possibly he'd be faced with a kind of an ongoing war of attrition which already similarities have been made to Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989 which the Soviets got bogged down in for a decade mm-hmm. and many have argued it was a factor in the, in, in the Soviet Union collapsing because it distracted them and took up lots of money mm-hmm. over many years and demoralised the population and this could well be like a second Afghanistan. And, and in that case, that, that's a real problem for Putin in the longer term. Okay. Thank you.